my first video on Dr. Ken Berry. Many people seem to really enjoy these sign spotlight videos of other health influencers, if that's Dr. Berg, which I have a ton of content on, or Dr. Fung, to now Dr. Berry. I'll go ahead and add a few disclaimers here because some people get really emotional when they hear criticism of one of their deities. I mean, idols. Come on, Nick. I mean, people they look up to in a perfectly objective way. On the other hand, people get emotional when the criticism isn't harsh enough or simply doesn't exist. Ah, fairness. A true sin. I will not be speaking to Dr. Barry's character as I do not know the man. I will only be assessing his claims from a scientific lens. I also recognize that you may have experienced excellent results following Dr. Barry's advice. I am not trying to invalidate your experience. A person's helpfulness does not mean that helpfulness is rooted in sound science, however. Whew. Disclaimers out of the way, let's see what Dr. Barry has to say on fat loss. I believe he has 10 tips for successful fat loss. We'll go over the most interesting ones. Now, how do I know anything about belly fat and how to get rid of it? I'm Dr. Kent Barry, a family physician with over 20 years of clinical experience. And a few years back, I was actually morbidly obese myself and suffered from Dunlap. That's something we talk about in the southern United States. It's when your belly Dunlaps over your belt. Okay, now that was funny. I like the sense of humor, but I can appreciate the style considering that I have extensive experience with the southern United States. Let's jump in. Number one, when you go grocery shopping, Stick to the outer aisles, the outer wall of the grocery store. That's where you're going to find all the natural foods. That's where you're going to find meat, eggs, cheese, full-fat dairy, some vegetables, some berries. These are real foods that your body actually know how to use, and they're not going to lead to increasing belly fat. They're actually going to help you burn that belly fat. Sticking to the outer sections of the grocery store. I've heard this advice before, and it's solid advice. Your body knows what to do with all the food that you consume because your cells are simply reacting to molecules that you consume. And those that don't react with your body are simply excreted. Your body isn't a thinking system. It's simply active and reactive through billions of biochemical reactions. But that said, it's true that the foods typically found in the deeper recesses of the grocery store jungle are ultra processed and highly energy dense. And it's good advice to simply go around Mordor instead of taking your chances within. Number two is choose only one ingredient foods. Okay, so if something has more more than two ingredients, whatever the ingredient is, it may be salt, don't buy it. Only buy one ingredient foods. Your body knows what to do with ribeye. It has one ingredient. Your body knows what to do with broccoli. It has one ingredient. But if you start shopping in the center of the store, you're going to find things that have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 ingredients, many of which are going to spike your insulin and cause you to not lose that sticky belly fat that you just can't get rid of. Eat one ingredient foods. Well, I don't think that you need to be that restrictive, but I get the overall message. Yes, eating those foods that I alluded to earlier that are energy dense and ultra processed, they tend to be filled with many ingredients. I'm not an expert on ultra-processing food, but it seems that according to this little review, the term ultra-processed necessitates at least five ingredients. If you have a more appropriate definition, I'd like to hear it. Either way, eating more whole foods is a great, often necessary way to go. Don't ever drink a carbohydrate or a sweetener, okay? So this applies obviously to the soft drinks, this also applies to the fruit juices. If what you're about to drink contains even one gram of carbohydrate, don't drink it because your body doesn't know the difference between added sugar or natural sugar. And so whether you're going to drink a Pepsi or whether you're going to drink some organic grape juice, it makes no difference. It contains sugar. It is going to make you build belly fat instead of getting rid of it. I feel like I'm pulled deeper and deeper into a riptide of information that I agree less and less with. Uh, we were largely on the same page for the first two, and this one has a nugget of truth to it, but it can also create unnecessary fear. If you're trying to lose body fat, it's often a great 
easy method of cutting down one's energy intake, as well as reserving that energy intake for more satiating foods to avoid sugary beverages of all kinds. I agree there. However, if you love having lemonade every day with one of your meals and it doesn't interfere with your ability to maintain the overall structure of your nutrition, meaning an energy deficit, high levels of satiety, and other ingredients for success, then your lemonade will not cause you to retain body fat. I have several videos going into the science of insulin, but if we want to test this idea directly, there have been studies where researchers had participants consume soda, milk, water, or Diet Coke, along with their normal meals, every day for six months. At the end of the study, the researchers measured the total body fat and found no differences between those that consumed the soda and those that didn't, including water. More appropriately, the comparison should be made against the milk condition because these two were isocaloric, meaning that they consume the same amount of calories. That does not mean soda is good for you. Hear me. I am not saying soda is good for you or that it will help you in your fat loss efforts. This same study did find that the distribution of body fat and some other health markers were altered after consuming soda, but that's not what we're discussing here. We're talking about overall body fat, and it shows there is no worse effect on body fat when consuming pure sugar if energy intake is equated. Like I said before though, generally it's a good advice to just cut it out, but we should be aware of the surrounding context. And now, a word from our sponsor, Coca-Cola. Recognize your sugar addiction. Any carbohydrate breaks down to sugar. Sugar hits our pleasure centers in our brain, just like some illicit drugs. It's absolutely, without a doubt, true that some people are very, very addicted to sugar. And so if you have a craving and fall off the wagon, then don't necessarily beat yourself up about being a glutton. Just look in the mirror and say, hi, I'm filling your name, and I am a sugar addict. And once you come to grips with that, that you're a sugar addict, it makes what you're fighting against much easier. Because if you know your enemy, then you have a better chance of defeating your enemy. But if you think that your enemy is just eating too much in general or laying on the couch too much, that's, that's kind of hard to fight. But if you know it's the sugar, it's the carbohydrates. I'm a sugar addict. I have to fight that specific battle every day. That's going to make it a lot easier. Hi, I'm Nicholas, and I am a science addict. But I really wouldn't say no to a cheesecake either. But in seriousness, the sugar addiction argument is a common one and something that I need to make a more detailed, nuanced video on. I don't think there's much doubt that most people enjoy highly palatable foods, among them being sugar. Some people have difficulty moderating their sugar intake and should probably avoid it if it gets in the way of their health goals. That said, it's not like people are consuming straight sugar. They're consuming a highly palatable version surrounded by many other palatability factors that companies put into their food to make them more appealing. If it were just sugar, we might as well just eat sugar straight out the bag, but that's not nearly as appealing. Still, we don't need to look at logical counter arguments if we lean on experts in the field like this scientific review. They mentioned that animal studies may show dramatic effects, but numerous human trials do not corroborate the addictive narrative, at least not so simplistically. They also state that food reward, in total, not the sugar alone, as well as energy density of food, so the amount of calories, were the bigger drivers. Again, this goes to say that if something tastes great, we'll eat much more and have difficulty stopping. But it isn't the sugar by itself, independent of other factors that influences this behavior. Frankly, it's something that I need to read into uh, the literature more, so I'm relying on experts in the field rather than my own analysis, but I hope to provide you that analysis sometime after this video publishes. Limit your alcohol intake to one serving a day, and this needs to be a carbohydrate-free, sweetener-free drink. And so if you make a mixed drink, make sure that you use something that has zero carbs and no artificial sweeteners, because any sweet taste in your mouth is going to raise your insulin level. And when your insulin's high, 
you ain't burning no belly fat. So you can have your one drink a day, and I don't mean one drink a day. I mean a serving size of alcohol a day if you even want it. The alcohol is not going to help you lose weight, but it's also not going to make you gain weight if you just have one serving. It's just kind of uh, a washed. So you make your decision. Limit your alcohol intake. Again, excellent advice. Uh, if alcohol is a big part of your day-to-day -day life, then just trying to cut back can have substantial effect that extends beyond just the drinking period and the energy intake. Many years ago, back when dinosaurs roamed these lands, I wrote a lengthy article on alcohol metabolism. I don't think it's up now since I've changed websites, but I went into biochemical detail of how alcohol is metabolized in our body. The quick version is that alcohol is converted to acetylaldehyde, which is toxic to our cells. So it is then further converted to acetic acid and then can be converted to acetyl-CoA. Why am I telling you all this? Well, because acetyl-CoA is the prerequisite for cellular energy production. And if you're getting your acetyl-CoA from alcohol, then you're not getting it from fat molecules which means that you are blocking your fat loss during the time that your body is converting the alcohol to acetyl-CoA. Again, not an issue if your overall diet is still energy deficient, but it's pretty easy to let alcohol take us off track, especially when you mix it with other additions. Overall, great advice by Dr. Barry. Implement some degree of intermittent fasting into your lifestyle every single day. Try to go for at least a 16-hour fast so if you sleep for eight hours a day, then that means you would you would wait four hours after you wake up to eat your first meal, and you would stop eating four hours before you go to bed. You don't have to do this every single day, but I want you to move towards doing a 16 or 18 hour fast every single day, because when you're fasting, your insulin level is very low normal, and that's the sweet spot for losing belly fat effortlessly. I hear this one a lot, and I'm with Dr. Barry on the overall point that intermittent fasting is an excellent strategy that works for many people. I've used it in the past many times to great effect. However, the idea that keeping insulin lower during the fasting period is the reason for fat loss success is incorrect. Yes, insulin is lower during the fasting period, but if you look at the totality of the day's insulin release, it is the same as if you consume three square meals assuming that nutrients are equated. We can see that here, with the heights and dips being more noticeable when eating fewer meals, but the total blood insulin levels over a 24-hour period are the same, and that again assumes that the macronutrients are the same in either condition. This is also corroborated in this study. There's more to say on the topic, like the fact that insulin isn't the only hormone to consider or the fact that energy deficits, regardless of diet composition, reduce insulin by their nature, but I won't bog the conversation down here. Ultimately, I agree that intermittent fasting is an excellent tool, especially for managing hunger, which is one of the primary ways to achieve fat loss success, but it doesn't have a magical benefit through its reduction of insulin as mentioned by Dr. Barry. Eat at least one gram of protein per kilogram of your body weight every day. Protein is satiating. Also, your, your body needs all of the amino acids contained in that protein to renew and rejuvenate itself. So the protein is not optional. Uh, eating this much protein a day may be new to you, but I promise you it's going to keep you for, for longer and that's going to keep you from eating the junk and make the belly fat keep disappearing. You won't hear any complaints from me on this one. Dr. Barry nailed it. Protein is unquestionably the most satiating nutrient. This review, and I could mention about 10 others, mentions added benefits including satiety, but also the slight thermogenic effect of consuming protein, meaning it increases our overall metabolism a tiny bit, because it has a high thermic effect of food, which means that it takes many enzymatic reactions in the intestines to break down the protein into amino acids, thereby costing cellular energy to prepare it for intestinal absorption by the epithelial cells. Additionally, it helps maintain lean mass by stimulating protein synthesis and reducing protein breakdown through its direct effects on master molecules like mTOR found within our muscle cells, bone cells, liver cells, and much more. Again, Dr. Barry hits this one out of the park. Eat more fat. 
And I know you just went, wait, what? Yeah, eat more fat. Fat is the most satiating of all three macronutrients being fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Carbohydrates don't really satiate you or fill you up at all. That's why you have to eat every two hours if you eat lots of carbohydrates. Also, eating carbohydrates turns immediately into sugar or glucose in your blood, and that spikes your insulin. Anytime your insulin is high, you ain't going to burn that belly fat. Does that make sense? So you want to eat plenty of protein, and you want to eat plenty of fat every single day. My favorite is the fat found in fatty cuts of animal meats. You can also eat plant fats. That's fine, but eat lots of fat every day. What? We literally just went over how protein is by far the most satiating nutrient. Beyond that, fat isn't even close to the most satiating macronutrient. It's actually the least. Now, before the low carbers send me to the prison of the heathens, allow me to explain. According to scientific reviews and individual studies, consuming fat either has worse satiety effects or leads to greater consumption post-exposure than carbohydrates, and certainly protein. Now, that does not explain why people on a low-carbohydrate, higher-fat diet experience improved ability to not overeat, as we see in this meta-analysis that indicated ketogenic or very low-carbohydrate diets do lead to superior satiety, according to this data. I don't have time to get into how to read force plots, but if the overall effects diamond moves to the right, there's an increase in satiety in favor of low-carbohydrate diets. So how can fats be low in satiety, yet a high-fat diet is high in satiety? Doesn't make sense. The answer is ketones and the ketone threshold. But you know what? Allow me to entice you into my next video, which discusses exactly that, along with the mechanisms of what happens to your brain on a low-carbohydrate diet in relation to fat loss. Or, if you don't care about that, then I'd love to speak with you in one of my other pieces of content. Thanks for watching, and I'll speak with you there.